Jim Lee, born August 11th, 1965 in Seoul, South Korea. He would go on to become one of the biggest artists in comic book history. His original plan for his career was to follow in his father's footsteps as a student of medicine, studying psychology at Princeton University. Lee found a passion for comics early on due to his own feelings as an outsider whilst in high school, but it was here at university, as he was preparing for graduation, looking towards a promising career as a medical doctor, that the legendary Jim Lee took a class in drawing and the course of his life was changed forever. Woof woof! Hey guys, it's me Marcus aka The Mad Dog and this is the top 5 notable works. A series which admittedly I kind of stole from Rummy's Corner which is a channel about fighters so make sure that you check him out. But in this series I'll take a figure within the comic book industry and try to tell the story of their career through only 5 of their works. Depending on who the focus is we'll be looking at the highs, the lows, the developments and the setbacks. And with a career that started in the 80s and still continues to this day, spanning the majority of the biggest publishers and titles along with being one of the lead figures for the foundations of the biggest movement in recent comics history with Image, to being at the forefront of a company-wide reboot with the new 52, which, you know, is definitely my jam. Who better than the one, the only Jim Lee to inaugurate what will hopefully be a very enjoyable series. Welcome to Jim Lee's Top 5 Notable Works. For a creator who rose to fame as quickly as Jim Lee, it's hard to choose a starting point. Prior to this, Lee had done a few issues of Alpha Flight due to the fact that he'd caught the eye of editor Archie Goodwin, but this was mostly just Lee's opportunity to find his feet within Marvel Comics, and it wasn't until 1988's Punisher War Journal that Jim Lee really made his first impact on the comic book scene. At first on the being recruited to do the finished lines, whilst writer Carl Potts handled the layout, Lee eventually proved himself capable enough to take over the full penciling duties. And although it seemed primitive compared to his later work, this is where Lee first began to shine. Taking inspiration from Frank Miller, David Ross, Kevin Nolan, Akira and Welsh Potatio, a name which I'm not really too sure that I'm pronouncing correctly, and secondly would be somebody that Lee would end up working closely with, those 15 issues on the Punisher title made him a name over at Marvel Comics and it was his stepping stone to much bigger opportunities. This was his opportunity to refine his early style by experimenting with enhanced lines, dynamic action and energetic storytelling that would become a signature for him throughout his career. This was the ideal for first big opportunity in Lee's career, but was just the start of before a 12 course meal and only opened the door for what was to come next. Initially joined as a fill-in for issue 248 in place of regular Uncanny X-Men artist and future Image founder Mark Silvestri, Jim Lee would go on to be the regular penciler from issue 267 in 1990. Arguably, this is Lee's most important work, and I'm technically cheating by including both Uncanny and Adjective-less X-Men, but if it's good enough for the Omnis, it's good enough for the list. In quite a poignant way, this was Jim Lee's comics journey coming full circle, having gotten into comics because he felt a connection with the X-Men. It'd be the same as if Boom Studios finally gave me a chance to write Power Rangers you know just saying. And besides, his work on Uncanny was essential to the rest of his career, as it was his first time collaborating with Inca Scott Williams. Not only did this give Lee a chance to test his skills on some of the biggest Marvel characters, but it was clear that his style had already developed and matured from his time on Punisher. His line work was refined, the dynamism, which I'm not even sure is a word, but the dynamism of his figures was improved, and he had a chance to influence the creation of a character. In this case, it was fan favourite Gambit, which he created alongside legendary X-Men writer Chris Claremont. But that's not the reason why X-Men's made it onto this list because at this point readers were buying the series as much for Lee as they were for Claremont. Older fans were returning to the title and waves of new readers gained exposure to the series, so much so that a second X-Men line was launched with Lee at the forefront and also co-writing alongside Claremont. As someone that wasn't alive during that time, it's hard to fathom how much of an impact this title had. Issue 1, thanks in part to its 5 variant covers and being released in 1991 during the speculator boom that comics experienced, meant that this was the best selling comic book of all time, with sales of 8.1 million units, a record that still stands to this day. To this day! To this day! And beyond just the numbers, the influence of Lee's work on X-Men is still present. Popular villains such as Omega Red were created during this time, and fan favourite characters such as Cyclops, Psylocke, Jean Grey and Storm all had redesigns which weren't hated, which is a rarity in comics. Sure we're only on the second pick and we've still got three more to go, but for many comic fans, and even non-comic fans, the design seen in this relaunch is what people think of when they're talking about the X-Men. And this was the inspiration for the team's look in the classic X-Men the Animated series. 
which again was most people's gateway for getting into this team. The collaboration of Claremont and Lee was short lived as it only lasted for three issues. As Chris left when it's Bob Harris sided with Lee over some of the duo's creative differences. Lee continued on with the series until issue 11 in 1992, at which point a storm was brewing behind the scenes and Lee was preparing to make the riskiest move of his career. And this wasn't just any storm, it was a wild storm. In late December 1991, Jim Lee accompanied Todd McFarlane and Rob Liefeld in a meeting with the then Marvel president Terry Stewart and editor Tom DeFalco. There were no demands, no bargaining, no discussions. The three of them along with Eric Larson, Mark Silvestri, Jim Valentino and Wills Potatio, yep, still haven't learned to say that one, were leaving the two big publishers to form their own company. They all had the same feeling that the work was taken for granted, with each of them being big names in their own rights and seeing their creations get movies, TV shows and video games, but receiving very little in the way of Rewards. This was a big deal. Suddenly the tide was shifting so that the creators profited the most from their work, and Lee, alongside his six partners, went on to make Image Comics. The result of this was devastating for Marvel. These were seven of Marvel's biggest names, and on the day when this news came out, stock prices plummeted, and this was the start of a journey that would lead to them filing for bankruptcy. All eyes were on the new company, many doubted it could succeed and that this was just a gimmick. At stake was their reputations, and they needed to prove that the big companies needed them more than they needed the company. Company. But with no major established characters to work with, they all had to create something new. Howdy, true believers. This is Jim Lee here. I'm not normally like this, I've just been hanging around Stan Lee too much. Uh, basically, we're here in Homage Studios. This is my little office, and this is a supplemental addition to the video. And I'm going to talk about my new book coming out called Wildcats Covert Action Teams. And this, along with Brandon Choi, is where Jim Lee created Wildcats, a superior team that dealt with the long spanning war between the Kirby and the Demonites, and yep, not sure if I'm pronouncing them right either. But admittedly, I'm not really going to jump any deeper into the plot because it's not the story that's made it onto this list, it's the importance over Lee's career. And Wildcats was his chance to create his own universe over characters and have complete creative control. Out of this we got titles such as Stormwatch, Gen 13 and Deathblow. Wildcats was Jim Lee's taste of freedom, something he never had at Marvel and something that he wasn't willing to relinquish after this. Additionally, this is where Lee began working with colorist Alex Sinclair, who brought a new level of depth to Lee's art. And with Scott Williams, they formed the Dream Team trio that would continue working together in future. Although I haven't met too many people who can tell me the story of each issue of Wildcats, and it's not likely to top many people's lists of the favourite Jim Lee work, this is perhaps the most important book that you worked on, as it signified his status as not just a great creator, but an absolute powerhouse throughout the comics industry who could stand on his own to perfectly drawn feet. His time as an independent creator was quite short lived and it was only a few years later in 1996 when Lee and Image co-founder Rob Liefeld were returned to Marvel for Heroes Reborn. But this was a different man than the one who left the company just a few years earlier. His style was just continuing to improve and more important, Lee knew the impact that he had. When Marvel demanded that he take on one of the Heroes Reborn titles as an ongoing, he said no and stood his ground. For the first time since he'd started working for Marvel, the creator now had the power. Without Wildcat it's hard to know if he would have done the same. So this was Jim Lee coming into his stride. By 1998, Jim Lee had been at the head of Wildstorm Comics, his own imprint at Image. On top of that, his personal life had changed. In total, he's got nine kids, and I'm not sure how many he had at this point, but the pressures of being the figurehead of a comic publisher meant he didn't have as much time for his family or for his art that got him into the industry in the first place. Due to this, he made the decision to leave Image and sold Wildstorm Comics to DC. At this point in his career, Lee could have stepped away from the industry completely. The money that he'd made in the 90s could have allowed him to live comfortably without worry, and it looked like that was to be the case. Sure he might have done a few guest appearances, the odd variant cover and he even did a backup story in Batman Black and White. All of that was until 2003 when Lee teamed up with legendary writer Jeff Loeb to create the 12 issue Batman Hush storyline. For me personally, this was Jim Lee at his absolute best. It was a buffet of Batman baddies with a story that did a decent job of weaving everyone in seamlessly. It holds a special place in my heart because this was my first exposure to Jim Lee and seeing such crisp lines, vast backgrounds and incredible splash pages changed my perception of comic book art. This was the first time I found myself lingering on pages and forgetting that there were speech bubbles. Everything about the art was at its peak here. Scott Williams had perfected his inking over Lee's illustrations and Alex Sinclair had the range of skills to bring Gotham City to life. Beyond just my 
itself, this was a lot of people's first entry into Batman comics. So much in the same way as what Lee had done for X-Men, he did here for The Dark Knight. Also at this time, Jim was asked to create a character for the upcoming Batman Rise of Sin Zoo game, and that was one of the selling points for it. But admittedly, that wasn't too successful, so I'm not really going to linger on that. But Lee could have walked off into the sunset having accomplished a life goal already, living a life that not many artists ever got a chance to. But Batman Hush signified that he wasn't just doing this for the money or the acclaim, he loved the medium, he loved these characters, and it shows most in this title. He wasn't just phoning it in for a paycheck, he levelled up even more so than what we'd seen before, and received the Wizard Fan Award for Favourite Penciler because of it. And it's incredible that he was doing the art for an industry giant such as Jeff Loeb, but that's somehow overshadowed by the presence of Jim Lee. Although Heroes Reborn was his return to the big two, this was the true return of the King, having proven what he'd set out to do with his colleagues when founding Image. He proved that the art was the power, the art was the pulling force, and the art was what he succeeded at best. By 2011, Jim Lee had already had a career that other artists could only really dream of. He'd worked for all of the biggest publishers, even being the founder of one of them. He created his own characters and had his work featured in TV shows and video games. Yet in 2011, along with Jeff Johns, Lee would be the architect of another movement that would send ripples throughout the comics industry, the New 52. After the Flashpoint event, the entire DC universe was to be rebooted back to issue 1, for the most part, in an initiative to bring in new readers. This was the biggest move DC had made since Christ crisis on infinite earths, and there at the forefront, determining the look and tone for the entire relaunch was the guy who was initially fabled to be a medical doctor, destined to only pick up a pencil to sign whatever it is that medical doctors sign. Although Lee was only on Justice League for the first year of the title, his influence was felt throughout the rest of the universe, and even through till today after DC Rebirth. People often say today that the New 52 didn't succeed or that it wasn't a good time for DC, but I disagree. Because of Lee's influence and similar to his impact on Batman and X-Men, an entire new wave of younger comic readers were able to start on DC Comics as a result of the New 52, and their first impressions of these characters were designs that were made by Jim Lee. And if we're being honest, the first 12 issues of the series were the highlight of Justice League, which is getting an omnibus later this year, which you can order for our sponsor, Organic Price Books, and if you use code WOOF WOOF, you'll get $2 off your order. But looking at it from a stylistic perspective, Justice League showcased everything that Lee had learned over his entire career. Although Batman Hush will always be his best work to me, in Justice League he got to experiment with more intergalactic threats, which opened the door for him to be able to try different panel layouts, test out his abilities on the constructions created by Green Lantern, and bring DC premier team back to the forefront of comics. If there was one title that DC needed to get right to show that they were serious about the New 52, to encourage old readers and new to jump on board and have faith in this initiative, it was Justice League. And they needed the biggest names that they could get to write it and to draw it, and that was of course always going to be Jeff Johns and Jim Lee. And even though that collaboration was short lived, what better fifth and final pick to signify the illustrious artistic career of Jim Lee than the premier title that was the flagship for one of the biggest comic book publisher's entire company-wide relaunch. This was Jim Lee at the very top of the industry. And sure, yes, you could make a counter-argument that he's done titles like All-Star Batman and Robin, which don't worry, I'm working on a video for. But despite being associated with a book like that, Lee was still the go-to guy to bring in new readers, a feat that not many artists can claim. Since then, Lee became the publisher of DC Comics, and although I hope his career as an artist is far from over, and he still continues to make big contributions to the comic community, if I was to tell the story of his careers in just five titles, I'd be hard pressed to choose anything other than the five in this video. It really shows how he started, how he improved, the decisions he had to make and the risks he had to take, but how it paid off in the end and led him to return to the thing he left with more respect and only continue to move from strength to strength. If you removed any of these five titles, his career could look completely different. Regardless of where his career goes, whether that sticks to being a publisher or he goes back to being an artist, what he's given to the industry is phenomenal and we're still seeing the the impact of that now as artists that are entering the industry now grew up reading his X-Men or started on comics with Batman Hush. Yeah he has his critics and I'm not really too sure why any of them would want to watch this video. An artist subjective which is something that the internet can often forget but whether you like his art or not the impact of Jim Lee can't be denied and that deserves respect. And that 
is the story of how I met your mother. Wait, wrong video. Now that was my top five notable works of Jim Lee and I'm hoping that you enjoyed this video and thank you for checking it out. This was something completely different. I've never tried anything like this before and I'm just hoping that it sticks a landing. At the time of recording this bit, I'm just before the final watch through so I don't even know if the video is good yet or not, but I've already been working on it for six days in between my full-time job doing streams and doing other videos. So I really hope that this was something that was good. I've had an idea of doing this in my head for so long and I'm just hoping that it's helped give a bit more of a spotlight to Jim Lee, not that he needs one from somebody like myself, I know that I'm not really anybody within the industry, but just my way of giving back to the community and hopefully honouring someone's history and someone's career, whilst also sort of exploring what I think their most important works are. Despite how stressful this has been, it has been really interesting to research into it and find all these different interviews and documentaries and just trying to piece together everything so that I can form my opinion. I know that there's going to be people that are going to nitpick every single last bit of this but I'm just hoping that there's at least one person watching this who enjoyed it. If you did make sure that you give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you're new here so that you never miss a video. In the comments down below I want to know who you want to see get the next episode of the top five notable works. If you do want to support the channel it is greatly appreciated. The best way to do it treat yourself to a book but make sure that you use organic price books there's an affiliate link in the description down below and if you use code woof woof you will get two dollars off your order. That's the best way to support the channel because first and foremost I want to make sure that I can continue to bring videos to you guys and using that link is one way of making sure that that can happen It does directly influence the channel, but also I do have a tip jar anything that you want to donate to there It is greatly appreciated, but I don't expect anything if you could though Please share this video where you can I know that there's a lot of people who might know the name Jim Lee And maybe want a bit of a documentary slash top five list about him And as long as you do it in a respectful way Maybe send it to him on Twitter or Instagram and see if we can actually get him to watch this video Why not check out some else that I've uploaded but until next time just make sure that you stay safe stay reading the best books that you can find and stay mad all you dogs woof woof see you at the next video